which heaven's joys so bright and sun, heart of my heart, whatever befall. Hello, and welcome back to our study of the New Testament church. You'll remember that last time we looked specifically at the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, a prophecy that anticipated that in the days of the Roman kings that God would establish His kingdom. Of course, God knew everything that was going to happen in order. And I, I guess we could pause momentarily and realize that that demonstrates that God truly is God and that the Bible really is His Word. I mean, think about it. In the days of Daniel, God already knew that Babylon would be overthrown by Medio Persia. Now, somebody alive in those days might have anticipated that. But would they have guessed that the next kingdom in line would be the Greek kingdom? And then beyond that, could they have ever foreseen Rome, which at that time must have seemed so far away? I doubt it. But God knew. God knew exactly how things would unfold, that one great earth-wide kingdom, Babylon, would give way to a second, Medo-Persia, and to a third, Greece, and to a fourth, Rome. And that in the days of the Roman kings, that God would at last bring His Son to the earth, that He would walk among men, and that the king, God's kingdom would grow until it encompassed the entire earth, having crushed, as it were, all the previous opposition. Nebuchadnezzar saw that in the dream that God gave him. As Daniel very well said, God is showing you what's going to happen in the last days, days that we've been talking about now for two straight lessons, days that were mentioned by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 2, days that were mentioned in Joel in Joel chapter 2, Days that were pronounced fulfilled or begun, as it were, in Acts chapter 2. And so now that we have established the fact that on the day of Pentecost, the kingdom would begin, we want to observe that Scripture supports us in that decision, that the kingdom really did begin on the day of Pentecost. Before we go too far into this idea... Let's pause for a moment and come to understand the nature of the kingdom that God would establish through Jesus Christ. Jesus is having a discussion with uh, the Pharisees in John, excuse me, in Luke chapter 17. And in verses 20 and 21, listen to what Jesus says. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, that's an interesting thing to think about. Normally, when someone says, where is the kingdom of, let's say, Saudi Arabia, then you and I would say, well, bring us a globe and let us show you on the globe where it is. And we would look to, to that area where it is found there between uh, <clears throat> Europe and uh, Africa. We demonstrate that very clearly. If someone said, where is the the kingdom of England located. Again, we would look to the globe and we would look to that spot on the eastern side of the Atlantic Ocean and there we would point it out. But Jesus says, you can't do that with my kingdom. It's not a kingdom that's going to come with observation. It's not going to be evident on the globe. Instead, <clears throat> Jesus said his kingdom would be within within the individual. Well, look at other passages that talk about this. In the book of John chapter 18, we find Jesus coming before Pilate. 
Pilate asks the obvious questions, I mean, questions that you'd expect to hear, really, from an earthly ruler. And one of his questions is found in John chapter 18. Uh, Particularly, we want to observe Jesus' answer as it's found in verse 36. Pilate's question is in verse 35. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Now listen to Jesus' answer. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So we've already observed the kingdom is within the individual. Now Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Now later in this study, we're going to be able to look at the way the Apostle Paul paints a picture of the kingdom. And he's going to say, our citizenship is in heaven, as he records it and reports it in uh, Philippians chapter 2, as he writes to those brethren at Philippi. But for the time being, observe that Jesus indicates my kingdom is not of this world. We're not going to fight for it in the physical sense. <clears throat> because it's not a physical kingdom. Instead, it is a spiritual kingdom that comes down from God out of heaven. And one more passage will help us understand the nature of the kingdom. It's found in Hebrews chapter 12. In verses 22 and 23 of that chapter, listen to what the penman, the inspired penman has to say. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. All right. He begins by saying, we've not come to an earthly place, to Mount Zion. Now here he's saying, my kingdom's headquarters, my kingdom's capital will not be in Jerusalem. Now that's new. The Jews, obviously in the Old Testament under the law of Moses, specifically under the reign of David, had come to recognize Jerusalem as their capital city. But Jesus says, you Christians have come not to Jerusalem, but instead you have come to a general assembly of people whose names are registered in heaven. Now, later in the same chapter, in verse 28, the writer continues, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Earlier in the chapter, the writer made it very, very clear that things on this earth can be shaken. We have seen earthquakes around the globe. Earthquakes in places like Nepal, for example. The great San Francisco earthquake in this nation back in the early 1900s and other earthquakes as well. We know what they do. When the earth shakes like that, things are torn apart. Things are destroyed. They're broken down. The writer of Hebrews says, we've come to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That is, this kingdom will never be torn down. This kingdom will never be defeated. This kingdom will go on eternally. So the nature of this kingdom is quite interesting. This kingdom is a kingdom that is within a man. This kingdom is a kingdom that is spiritual in in nature. This kingdom is a kingdom that will be eternal in its existence. Now, 
Recognizing all that, we want to begin to specifically demonstrate when that kingdom began. In order to do that, let's look at a few verses that indicate the kingdom is coming. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 3. You may remember the birth of that man that is most often called John the Baptist. John the Baptist had a role to play. That role was to announce the coming of the king. Listen in part to what he says in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, or at least what is reported about him and what he said. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> if I, I went home or you went home today and found someone there in the kitchen, we might ask the question, when will it be supper time? And they might say, well, in just a little bit. It's just about ready. When we heard that, we would know it's not supper time yet. Now, some of us might then go and get the paper and begin to read it. Others might go and change our clothes. We might go out and work a little bit in the yard. We could do a lot of things. Why? Because supper's not here yet. It's coming. That is the exact idea that John the Baptist is setting forth. The kingdom's not here yet but it's at hand, it's nearby, it's coming. We see similar talked about in Matthew chapter 4, when in verse 17, Matthew reports, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice the kingdom is still in the future. It's declared to be at hand, but it is coming. So we want to keep looking. Other passages clearly demonstrate that the kingdom was declared by Christ to be something that must be preached as if it were near. Look at Matthew chapter 10. In a section that we most often call the limited commission, in verses 5 through 7, we hear the Lord saying to those that he is sending out, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what is he saying? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Preach that it is near. In the book of Luke, chapter 10, Luke uh, deals with some of these matters as well. Listen to what he says about the kingdom in Luke chapter 10, as he makes this great record, particularly in verse 11. The very dust of your city, which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. Observe that, near you. It's not here yet. Again, all of these passages are pointing ahead. They're saying it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's at hand. It is near. Not here yet, but it's on the way. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus came with his disciples to the borders of the coast of Caesarea Philippi. As they came there, Jesus asked them a question. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now observe. Clearly, the topic of conversation on that occasion is, who am I? And that's the question Jesus asked. So we might say it this way, who is Jesus? You know, men had a lot of answers. Uh, they knew he was some type of prophet. You can tell that because of the names that they named, John the Baptist and others like him. But the reality is they didn't know who he was. And so then Jesus turns to the disciples again and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded to him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, 
For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Observe at least two things here. First of all, observe that Jesus says, I will build my church. It's not here yet. But then secondly, observe that the topic of conversation continues to be the same. Who is Jesus? Who do people say Jesus is? Who do the disciples say he is? Who did God indicate that he was? All of that is what the topic is in this case. So when Jesus says, upon this rock will I build my church, he is obviously talking about who he is. What Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That declaration clearly is the very foundation stone, as it were, of the church that Jesus would build at some point in the future. It's no wonder then that the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 would say, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the kingdom is coming. We have seen by its very nature that it is not a kingdom of this world. Instead, it is a kingdom that, that will be within us, that will come down from heaven, that will be unshakable. It will be eternal in its nature. We have seen that John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and then the disciples of Christ under the direction of the Lord all announced that the kingdom was at hand. It's coming. We had then followed that up by observing that Jesus said he would build his church. And significantly, he talks next to Peter by saying, and I will give to thee the keys to the kingdom. Now, if someone said, I'm going to build your house, and then they said, and then I will give you the keys to your mansion, you and I both would understand that your house, in the mind of this individual, is the same as your mansion. Jesus said, I will build my church, but then he's going to give to Peter the keys to the kingdom. Don't you see then that the church and the kingdom are in the mind of Christ one? That they are just two descriptive terms to describe the church of our Lord. His kingdom is ultimately his church. Now, in the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 1, Mark gives us further insight in reference to the kingdom. <clears throat> when he reports what Jesus told them on that occasion, turn with me to that passage and hear the words of the Lord. Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. So now we're still looking forward because he says there's some here who will see it come with power. But furthermore, we ob we're observing that it will come with power. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus again talks about that coming with power. Immediately prior to his ascension, in Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, Listen to what Jesus told them. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and to the end of the earth. Now we're beginning to, to see this picture draw a little bit more tightly into focus. We've seen Jesus say, there's some who are standing here now who will still be alive when they see the kingdom come with power. Now, Jesus says, go into Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit when you will receive power. So we are beginning to anticipate the beginning of the kingdom as being the time when both of those things would take place. Turn with me then to Acts chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 2, listen to what Luke reports. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Remember, Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait. When the Spirit comes, you will receive power. Now we see the Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost, immediately following the ascension of our Lord up into heaven. We see the Spirit coming. And when the Spirit comes, what happens? Why, it's quite clear, isn't it? They receive power, and it's unbelievable power to most of us because these ignorant fishermen are able to speak in languages that they have never studied. Truly, the Holy Spirit came with power on the day of Pentecost. So what can we anticipate will take place on that day of Pentecost? Peter delivers a tremendous gospel sermon. We've referred to it earlier in our study. In that sermon, <clears throat> he comes to the conclusion that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The word Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah. And both of these words mean anointed. Who did they anoint back in those days? Well, they did anoint priests, and I must acknowledge that. But for the most part, anointing was reserved for kings. You remember? Samuel, the prophet, anointed Saul to be the first king in Israel. And then we have uh, Samuel anointing David to be the second king in Israel. Later on, we will have yet another. We will have Elijah, and he will anoint Jehu to be king. And so when, when Peter declares that Jesus is both Lord and Christ, he is describing him as the anointed one, the king who would rule over his kingdom. Well, it should be no surprise that that cut the people to the heart. And as we've already observed, they ask, what shall we do? The implication is to be saved. And the answer that Peter gave is very clear. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he began to plead with them. He begged them uh, with many different words, urging them to save themselves from the wicked generation in which they lived. And then as many as gladly received the word were baptized. And that same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So the kingdom has come. It's come with power. And some of those who stood with Jesus in Mark chapter 9 were present on that day of Pentecost. They were there to see that powerful display of the Holy Spirit. But now that the doors to the kingdom have been thrown open, some 3,000 people obey the gospel and they are added to the church, the kingdom of our Lord, as we have already seen that those two are synonymous. Now, clearly the kingdom had come because Luke is able to write in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and say that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he speaks of a kingdom already in existence 
when he says he has translated us from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his own dear son. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, the apostle Paul talks to the, the people of Thessalonica, the Christians there. They are suffering. They're being persecuted. He literally uses words that describes that they're being squeezed out like grapes by the torture that they're being put through. But Paul makes it very clear they were suffering for the kingdom of God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, as we have already seen, they received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And then in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, the apostle Paul says that he is their companion in the kingdom and in the tribulation. So what have we observed? We have observed very clearly that prior to the day of Pentecost, John the Baptist, Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, all declare that the kingdom is in the future. Jesus is going to build his church. He's not built it yet, but he's going to build his church. It's all pointing forward. He then talks about some being present with him who would see the kingdom come with power, but it's still ahead. They haven't seen it yet. They're going to see it. He points even further to the future in Acts chapter one, when he says that they should go to Jerusalem and when the Holy Spirit comes, they'd receive power from on high. That power was displayed on the day of Pentecost. And on that day, the doors to the kingdom are open, just like Jesus promised. And souls are added. And then souls are added daily to the church, which is equal to the kingdom. We have seen that the kingdom is considered to be in existence in all of these passages that we looked at in the New Testament, places like Colossians 1.13 and Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, all of these indicate that the kingdom already exists, that they are already flowing into it or they are already a part of it. Our confirmation comes in what we studied before in an earlier lesson. And that is that when <clears throat> Cornelius and his household received the ability to speak in tongues, that Peter instantly insists that they be allowed to be baptized because the Holy Spirit had fallen on them as it did on us at the beginning. And that's the way he reports it in Acts chapter 11 and verse 15. And that clear report lets us know the kingdom began on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem. We don't have to wonder when is Christ going to establish his kingdom? Oh no, he's already a king seated on his throne as described in Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four. He is reigning as king even now over his spiritual kingdom, the church, and we can be a part of it. Still be my vision, oh.